Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Emily Pritt, and I'm here today on behalf of the Bowerman Track Club. Thank you all for coming on such short notice. Before we start, I'd like to ask that everyone please refrain from tweeting or otherwise promoting the context of this press conference until its conclusion. Unfortunately, we, we are convening under very sad and, as you'll hear, unjust circumstances. To describe those circumstances, we are first going to hear from Paul Green, uh, founder of Global Sports Advocates and one of the foremost sports attorneys in the world. Then Shelby Houlihan, Jerry Schumacher, and Shalene Flanagan all have statements to share, after which we will open things up to any and all questions you may have. So without further ado, here's Paul Green. Thank you very much. So my name is Paul. Um, I've grown to admire Shelby Houlihan tremendously over the last four or five months. Um, I first heard from Shelby in January. And uh, Shelby, I can tell you, having done these cases, hundreds if not thousands of cases involving anti-doping over the years, is an innocent athlete. She's the latest athlete to fall prey to environmental contamination. And, um, and in my view, um, what happened to her is entirely unjust. This result was gonna live with me for the rest of my career, just because I know Shelby didn't do anything wrong and she's banned. And, um, and it's, it's quite frankly, just not only sad, um, but I think it undermines the entire anti-doping system, what happened in this case. Shelby um, tested positive for a substance called nandrolone back in January. Um, the AIU did not announce it because nandrolone is not a straightforward analysis. It's an endogenous compound, which means it naturally occurs in the body. Um, it's one of the hardest substances to figure out where it came from. Um, it is both endogenous, meaning naturally occurring, and exogenous. And... Uh, and in fact, one of the ways that it endogenously occurs in the body is through food contamination, through eating pork, certain types of pork, it is well known have no own in it. And uh, in Shelby's case, she ate, uh, she ate a burrito about 10 hours before from a Mexican restaurant um, that we concluded very, very early on um, contained pig organ meat. Pig organ meat is one of the sources for nandrolone. 10 hours before would have been perfect in terms of the timing of the level that was in Shelby's system, which is an extremely low level, very low. Um, so low, in fact, that in my view, it became clear that it was impossible to distinguish where it came from. And the case should have been reported out as what's known as an atypical finding, meaning more investigation is required. But that isn't what happened. The lab decided it was exogenous. Uh, and I'll explain to you where I think that that was the wrong determination with some science slides. And, uh, and stuck to that analysis, never, never wavered. We told them five days in that we asked for her B sample analysis to be considered under some of the technical documents that actually contemplate this exact scenario from happening. And, uh, and that analysis on her B sample was never recorded in the lab document package. Uh, we don't think that analysis was actually ever done. Um, and here we sit, um, they came back and said she had exogenous nandrolone in her, in her urine. Um, and we don't believe there's any way, I know Shelby didn't have exogenous uh, nandrolone in her urine because the only way that could have happened is if Shelby would have taken an oral nandrolone supplement, which she did not do. Um, she did not have an injection. That was clear because her next test five weeks later was clean. In fact, every test she's taken before or after was clean. She had this one abnormal test and that was it. So I'm just gonna see if I can share my screen here just show a few slides and then I'm happy to take some questions. Um, here we go. So again, this is an endogenous threshold compound. This is not a normal compound substance that is synthetic and appears in the urine, it's easy to detect. There's multiple ways this can show up in the urine. Pregnancy is one. We had Shelby take a pregnancy test, she was not pregnant. Uh, poor consumption is another one. And 19 or steroids administration, which would be taking it either orally or by way of injection is another way. Shelby's ratio was 3.9 on her B sample. You can see these are mean ratios of a paper that was done by the professor in the lab that actually reported out her, 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 her result as exogenous. Shelby's level was 3.9, nothing that was never considered as part of the analysis of her B sample. Further, this is a laboratory document that went into effect on April 1st uh, that was published on December 21st. Shelby's analysis was done in January that specifically contemplates the idea of borophil or, or pig consumption. It says, following the consumption of 
the edible parts of non-castrated male pigs, which is a boar. Boars are part of the food system in the United States. Um, there aren't that many, but there's about 2% of, of uh, pigs that are slaughtered are part of the boar or part of the food system. It's legal to kill boars and put them in the food system. Anyway, uh, it says if you're less than 10 nanograms, Shelby's level was five. And if you are what they call Delta 13 C value is between minus 15 and minus 25, Shelby's was minus 23. Basically at that point, if an athlete invokes it, in our view, the section said there's no way to distinguish where it came from. If the consumption of edible parts of pigs is invoked, which we did on the 19th of January, this may be established based on pharmacokinetics. It actually says the urinary origin may not be established by GCC IRMS analysis. And that is exactly what they use for Shelby's case, only the GCC IRMS analysis. So we, we implored them to report this as an atypical finding, to test her again, um, to not ruin an innocent athlete based on one abnormal result that easily could have been explained by what we told them, but it fell on deaf ears. Um, this would have been how an atypical finding would have been reported out. In the middle column, it's highlighted. Uh, any factor preventing a reliable GCC IRMS analysis, and our, in our view, uh, our evidence of her eating the, the burrito 10 hours before, the timing, the fact that she did not have an injection, all showed that it wasn't reliable based on her urinary markers, but again, uh, this, was, this was ignored. This is where an atypical finding would have taken us. It would have been a report that would have led to a further investigation instead of uh, leading to an anti-doping rule violation. Now, we had a hearing, um, an emergency hearing that was confidential, uh, hoping that Shelby would win and this would not come out. Unfortunately, uh, we lost. June 11th, the decision came out um, and the AIU, I'm sure, will announce it now that we're having this press conference tomorrow. Um, anyway, it was going to come out this week, but Shelby's banned for four years. Her career is essentially over and, uh, and she didn't take a steroid. I can tell you that 100%. So, um, you know, there's been multiple studies done about this. Food contamination is a huge problem. These labs can detect now in the picogram range in parts per billion that they couldn't detect in the past, and they just don't know what to make of it. What are we doing with these parts per billion uh, low-level findings by ruining people's lives instead of just being more circumspect about it and doing an atypical finding, which they could have done, and seeing what was really going on? So with that, I want to hear you to hear from Shelby, and then I'm happy to take any questions. Did I, was there a question asked? No, Shelby oh, is, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have, let Shelby and Jerry and Shalane make their statements and then we will take questions after that. So Shelby, uh, at this time, Shelby would like to make, uh, share her statement. Yeah. Um, since I started running when I was five years old, I've had dreams of running professionally, setting records, winning an Olympic gold medal and being one of the best in the world. I've always blindly believed that I was good enough to achieve those things. As I've gotten older, I've put in more time, I've put in more miles, I've become more dedicated and I've learned to genuinely love this sport. It's what brings me the most joy and it's where I feel the most me. I've always done it the right way. I've put my head down and I've just worked at being better year after year. I've stayed patient and I've trusted that the work and consistency would show. I still have all of the same dreams I had when I was five and I've been incredibly fortunate to have been able to achieve some of them. I still have others that I'm working towards. But the thing that truly drives me is the love and joy I get from what I do and the curiosity to find out what my potential is. On January 14th, 2021, I received an email from the Athletics Integrity Unit, the AIU, informing me a drug testing sample that I provided on December 15th, 2020, has returned as an adverse analytical finding for a steroid called nandrolone, and that I was therefore subject to an immediately, immediate provisional suspension. When I got that email, I, I had to read it over about 10 times and Google what it was that I had just tested positive for. 
I've never even heard of an andrelone before. I've since learned that it has been long understood by WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency, that eating pork can lead to a false positive for nandrolone, since certain types of pigs produce it naturally in high amounts. Pig organ meat, or pig offal, has the highest levels of nandrolone. In the following five days after being notified, I put together a food log of everything that I consumed the week of that December 15 test. We concluded that the most likely explanation was a burrito purchased and consumed approximately 10 hours before that drug test from an authentic Mexican food truck that happens to serve pig offal near my house in Beaverton, Oregon. I notified the AIU that I believe that this was the source. Although my levels were consistent with those of subjects and studies who were tested 10 hours after eating the source, and WADA technical guidelines require the lab to consider it when analyzing Nandrolone, the lab never accounted for this possibility. They could have reported this as an atypical finding and followed up with further testing. The anti-doping experts I've reached out to say that they should have. I did everything I could to prove my innocence. I passed a polycraft test. I had my hair sampled by one of the world's foremost toxicologists. WADA agreed that test proved that there was no buildup of this sub substance in my body, which there would have been if I had, had been taking it regularly. Nothing moved the lab from their initial snap decision. Uh, instead, they simply concluded that I was a cheater and that a steroid was ingested orally, but not regularly. I believe my explanation fits, this, fits, the, facts, fits the facts much better because it's true. I also believed it was dismissed without proper due process. On June 11th, I received, sorry, I received the news that the court of arbitration did not accept my explanation of what had occurred and has subsequently banned me from the sport for four years. I feel completely devastated, lost, broken, angry, confused and betrayed by the very sport that I've loved and poured myself into just to see how good I was. I wanna be very clear. I've never taken any performance enhancing substances and that includes that of which I'm being accused. I believe in the sport and I believe in pushing your body to the limit just to see where that limit is. I'm not interested in cheating. I don't do this for the accolades, money, or for people to know my name. I do this because I love it. I have so much fun doing it, and it's always the best part of my day. This sport means everything to me. I believe doping is doping and cheating is weak. It shows a a disbelief in yourself and not only shames you, but also shows a complete disregard for people that support you. I would never disrespect the sport, my competitors, my teammates, my coaches, my family, my fans, or myself in this way. I love and respect this sport too much. The drive that keeps me going is the curiosity to know how far I can push my natural limits and reach my potential. I've always wanted to be able to stand at the top of the Olympic podium with a gold medal around my neck, knowing that I did that. Now I'm not sure that I'll ever get the opportunity to truly pursue that dream. I'm gonna continue to fight to prove my innocence. I will not sit down and accept a four year ban for something that I did not and I would never do. I absolutely, and I absolutely respect and wholeheartedly support the fight to catch athletes who disrespect the sport by cheating and doping, but I'm not one of them. In the meantime, I ask for respect and privacy while I continue to navigate this stressful time. As devastating as this experience has been, I feel very fortunate to have such an amazing group of people that have been fighting alongside me and supporting me throughout this nightmare. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Shelby. Um, at, th at this time, Jerry Schumacher would like to share a statement. Thank you, Shelby. That was very moving. Um, 
this is a bit long, but I have a lot to say, so uh, please bear with me. To the track and field community. In January of this year, I was notified that Shelby had recorded a positive drug test in December of 2020. The positive test was for a substance called nandrolone, something ne that neither Shelby nor I had ever heard of. Shelby was placed on a provisional suspension as we tried to understand how this test could have happened. Over the course of the past six months, I've learned more than I ever wanted to know about drug testing, about the procedures and organizations that govern our sport. What I've learned has eroded all the faith I had in their ability to fairly serve and protect clean athletes. Throughout this process, we were confident that the truth would lead to justice. What I've come to learn instead is that anti-doping authorities are okay with convicting innocent athletes so long as nine out of 10 convictions are legitimate. That is wrong. It is my understanding that our drug testing technology is becoming so sensitive that anti-doping labs are catching increasing numbers of clean athletes. Shelby's positive test was for an exceedingly small amount of a substance that is known from WADA's own studies to be present in certain types of pork. Less than 12 hours after she ate at a Mexican food truck that served pig organ meat. I do not understand how any competent or unbiased body could fail to conclude that Shelby was innocent. Shelby was treated unfairly at every step of this process. The AIU refused to charge her for months despite no additional evidence being presented opting to leave her in a provisionally suspended state until they were forced by Shelby's legal team to charge her and agree to a hearing before CAS so that Shelby could compete at the Olympic trials. I believe if this had been USADA handling her case, it would have been handled differently. At the very least, I'm confident she would have been treated fairly. Shelby, I know you and I know the, the type of athlete you are and far more importantly, the type of person you are. I don't have the words to articulate the depths of sadness I feel right now for you. I want you to know that you are not alone. I can only hope that in the coming days and weeks that you will feel supported by the very best aspect of our sport, that being the track and field community. To my coaching colleagues and friends in track and field, you are the ones who know me. You know me as a friend, you know me as a competitor. You know me as an imperfect and flawed human, but you also know how I feel about doping and know that I would never disrespect you by allowing or supporting it in any fashion. I will lean on you the most during this time because we have been gifted with an incredible opportunity to work with young, passionate people and none of us should ever have to watch one of them go through something like this. It's now my understanding that friendly fire casualties in the war on doping are acceptable. And we should all be outraged by that. No clean athlete should ever have to go through what Shelby is right now. And we need to do demand better for our athletes. To the clean athletes out there that I've coached against, you have every reason to be confused and distrust, distrustful of people in the sport. You are forced to witness and, and compete against dopers all the time. You are also led down roads of confusion that make you question everyone and everything. I understand, I do it too. All I can tell you is that, is that I'm sorry this adds another layer of doubt. Shelby, your competitor, friend, and teammate has had her entire career taken away from her for something she didn't do. Not all of you are gonna believe me and many of you are gonna be skeptical, but to those that do, you should be outraged that this can happen. You should be outraged that the most powerful organizations in our sport are not protecting you. You should be outraged that it happened to Jerry and Lawson, Ajay Wilson, Brenda Martinez, and now Shelby. You should be outraged that it can happen to you. You should demand better from your sport. You need to demand better from your sport. To the powerful organizations that can enact change, where are you? What are you doing? Why does this continue to happen to clean athletes? My understanding is that here in America, we come into contact with many contaminants that can lead to positive tests in our food, fluids, and supplements. 
It is also my understanding that USADA is aware of this and accounts for this in their analysis of each case. Yet Shelby is still in this position. To borrow a leading anti-dopers official response to me, how many lambs will be led to the slaughter before we address this issue? And finally, to the AIU and WADA, shame on you. Shame on you for not caring about the truth. Shame on you for using athletes in a political chess match. You got it very wrong this time and that's not okay. It's not okay to be right nine times out of a 10 when you decide to execute someone's athletic life and dreams. You do not deserve this power. What we are witnessing here is a great tragedy in the, his in the history of American distance running. Not only is Shelby an exceptionally talented athlete, but she has also developed her talent through hard work and discipline. She is tough as nails. She is an exceptional teammate. She loves to compete. She just might be the best 1500 meter runner in the world this year, but we will never get the opportunity to find out. And that is a tragedy. Over the past six months, I've learned that certain organizations in track and field have abandoned clean athletes. We need drug testing and aggressive drug testing at that to work towards cleaner sport. I will always support that, but the system is broken. It is a system that no longer protects clean athletes and instead ruins them. We can only assume that this will continue to happen if we, coaches and athletes, continue to accept it. I hope that we demand better from our sport because our athletes deserve it. Thank you, Jerry. Um, finally, we'll have Shalene make her uh, share her statement. Um, thank you, Emily. I uh, wrote this the other night. Um, it's Saturday night, June 12th, 2021. I'm sitting in bed trying to put pen to paper with a broken heart. Grieving over what was and what could have been. I am devastated. I am gutted. I am broken. I am overwhelmed. I am sad. I am angry. And I am so, so mad. Shelby Houlihan, formerly my teammate, now my athlete, who I consider like my little sister, has been convicted of a doping violation that removes her from the sport of track and field for four years. In December of 2020, she ate dinner from a local Portland food cart. She unknowingly ordered a burrito with meat that contained nandrolone. The following morning, Shelby was drug tested by the AIU and the tests by water are now so sensitive that they pick up trace amounts of banned substances from unexpected sources. I have followed Shelby from high school in Iowa through the collegiate ranks at Arizona State and then helped recruit her to BTC in 2015. We were teammates for four years before I became one of her mentors and coaches. In these years of training alongside Shelby or coaching her track side, I've had an up close glimpse into this incredible young woman who is Shelby? From where I get to stand, she is a woman comfortable in her own skin, unapologetically dares to simply be herself. She is a kid, she is playful, she's a homebody. She has a smile that makes you want to smile. She has an obsession for everything Harry Potter and a deep affection for her cat, Miko, and her family. But ultimately, Shelby just really loves to run. With every fiber of my being, I know Shelby did not cheat and would never. All Shelby has ever wanted to find out in every workout and every race is how good she can be. We are living a nightmare that we can't seem to wake up from. And my concern is that if this tragedy can happen to us, then it can happen to you, coaches and athletes.
the guiding principle for myself and what I instill in my athletes is it's great to be fast, but it's better to be a great person. And Shelby is a great person. I'm desperately trying to understand why this has happened. How can this happen to an innocent person? How has the sport and governing bodies failed her and us so badly? How could we not protect her? I have experienced plenty of heartache in my own career. I've lost out on medals and dreams to those who cheat, but I would rather lose all my medals and wins to dopers than to witness one innocent athlete be robbed of a life that they have earned. If this is where the sport I love is headed, then I don't know if I can continue to be a part of it. I refuse to believe this is acceptable and neither should you. Thank you all for those statements. Um, we're now gonna open up the panel for questions. We feel really strongly that the more facts of Shelby's case are known, the more clear it will be to everyone that she's done absolutely nothing wrong and is being wrongly deprived of her career as an athlete. So to ask a question, um, please use the hand raising function on your Zoom and we'll recognize one question at a time and allow you all to verbally ask your question. Sorry, one second. All right, um, Allison, wait, and, and when I, when I um, allow you to speak, please uh, identify your media outlet, um, Allison Wade. Hi, I'm Allison Wade from Fast Women. Um, I'm curious what your, um, you know, sort of course of action is from here and what options you have as far as appealing this. Hi, Allison, I'll, I'll answer that question. Um, the way this case worked, normally it would be uh, an initial hearing before the Athletics Integrity Unit panel, and then you'd have an appeal to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. However, given the timing, uh, because she was provisionally suspended for more than three months without being charged, and then we were right up against the Olympic trials, we agreed to a single hearing before CAS. Um, and so, with that hearing now being over, the appeal route left is to the Swiss Federal Tribunal uh, in Lausanne. Okay, um, Kara, Kara Goucher. Hi, this, this, can you guys hear me? This is for <laughs> Paul. Hi, Kara. Paul, I'm wondering why if you were in front of Cass and you had I'm assuming you had like the facts and the burrito receipt. Why are, why do you think it's just being ignored or fell on deaf ears? You know, I always believe every single time when I go in that the truth will come out in a hearing, Kara. And I've never felt more strongly going into a hearing that we were able to get it across. Um, it wasn't just the facts, it was clear what had happened in terms of eating this uh, 10 hours before. WADA's actually accounted for this in the technical documents. They're actually quite progressive on this. Uh, and it's not even an anti-doping rule violation. Typically with meat, you would, have, uh, you would have a violation and then you just try to, the determination would be what the sanction is, whether it's no fault or four years. Here, it wouldn't even be a violation. And so the burden technically was on them to prove it wasn't from meat. We don't know what happened because all we have is a one page operative award. Um, again, it was because the timing was such that they couldn't put out a full reasoned award. It could take several months for that to come out, but we don't know the reasons why. Kevin Sully. Yeah, Kevin Sully from Flowtrack. Can I get some more clarity on the, the timeline? What, what happened? Any communications between January 14th, which I believe Shelby said is when the AIU notified her, and then this past June 11th? So January 14th is the initial notice that was provided by the AIU that her A sample had, as they reported it out, as exogenous. 
meaning synthetic, and therefore it was an adverse analytical finding. Um, within five days, we reported back on the 19th of January that we believe the source was this pig offal burrito, and we were asking them to do the B sample analysis and take this into account, which took place on the 22nd of January till the 26th of January. Um, then we got that, that B sample report came back in the end of January with no, no anywhere in the lab packet or the B sample test report that they'd actually accounted for it. Um, but that under their, under their view, the B confirmed the A, that was it. Um, but then it was several months. We went back and forth with them. We provided many submissions as to what happened. We hired a private investigator who went and got uh, all sorts of food that we analyzed. Um, we did a lot of stuff. We sent Shelby to go do the hair sample analysis, to do the polygraph exam. We hired our own expert who was a former um, WADA scientist from Europe. And he, his analysis was that it should have been an atypical finding under the technical documents. So we were hopeful all along, uh, all the way up through April that they would consider all this and drop the case. Um, they didn't. And we filed with CAS to force them to charge her because they weren't doing anything. She was just sitting there provisionally suspended. Uh, eventually, um, in, in May, they did charge her in mid-May because of uh, what we did. It We filed a CAST to force them to charge her, and they did. And then we, we eventually agreed to the single hearing before CAST, and we had the hearing um, on the week of the, the first week of June, and then the decision came out Friday. Uh, John Galt. Hi. Um, my question is, what specific uh, rules, either of water rules, AIU procedures, do you guys believe need to be changed? And will you be like campaigning for this? Is this something that you, you guys will be taking steps and raising your voices to sort of, to fix? Jerry or Shalane, why don't you take that one since I don't, I don't need to take every question. Jerry, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I mean, here, here's the bottom line. If we're in a system that is supposed to protect clean athletes and instead these are the events that are happening and I've just, I named four athletes just in the last few years that have gone through this exact scenario, it's broken, it doesn't work. I mean, tell me, I've got a team full of, of, of athletes now that are afraid to be tested. Who wants to be tested by WADA now? I mean, this, this, is a, this is a crime against all these innocent and clean athletes. So am, am I gonna scream from the top of my lungs? Yeah, absolutely. I hope all the other athletes and coaches do too. Otherwise this will continue to happen. This is not, this, this is, there's no excuse for this. This should never happen. If this is, if they can't get it right, it needs to change. It needs to change. You know, Jonathan, I think it's important to keep in mind that the system has evolved here in trying to recognize this obvious issue with food contamination. If you go back 10 years, there was no, um, no thresholds for anything. There was a situation in Mexico and other countries where hundreds of athletes were testing positive and getting four-year bans for meat contamination. Ultimately, they did do a threshold for clenbuterol two years ago that is now in place. And on June 1st, they actually just did a threshold for the substance that Ajay Wilson tested for four years ago, which USADA handled thankfully, and she got a no fault. But looking back, if USADA wasn't on that case, I don't know what would have happened. I represented her too. Um, but Xeranol is now, there's now a threshold for that one. Uh, but there is, and there is, and there is an accounting in the documents for this substance. We just believe that it wasn't properly followed. There's a lot of deference to the labs to get this right. And these are judgment calls by these lab directors. There's supposed to be harmonization. Every lab's supposed to report it out the same, but you know, they, I don't think that would have happened in every lab. And also this lab was supposed to get a second opinion and they didn't. It's not required, but it's strongly recommended that they seek a second opinion as part of the B sample analysis and put that second opinion letter into the B sample analysis. That was never done either. So this was just one lab director making the decision on their own to ruin Shelby. And that's how it happened. Alex uh, Ozzy, Azzy. Hey, thanks so much. Um, I have two questions, if that's okay. Um, I wanna make sure in terms of the timeline, you said that you went to CAS 
to force the charge. What was the timeline that would have been in place had had you not gone, gone to CAS for that? There is really no deadline for the prosecutorial entity here at Athletics Integrity Unit to actually charge an athlete. The rules say they must be charged within a reasonable time. It's not really clear what that means, but uh, conceivably an athlete could be provisionally suspended for a year without being charged um, under the way the rules are written. We came up with, an, uh, we, we, we filed an appeal that had never been filed before under a specific rule. And I basically said, they're not complying with the rule, which mandates an expedited procedure. And therefore uh, we're asking them to issue a decision or notice of charge to drop the case. And ultimately on the day that they had to respond to Cass on that appeal, they, they charged her. And then um, a follow-up to that. Um, how does the process with the AIU work differently or similarly to USADA? Like are there different steps or timelines involved? I mean, everybody's following the same process, but you know, a process is only as good as the people that are implementing it. And I feel like USADA's approach is to me, different than the rest of the world, and I say that in a good way. I have enormous respect for the lawyers and the scientists that work for US Anti-Doping Agency. In my opinion, they do things the right way. They're the leaders in the world, and um, that's. I feel very strongly that if they were handling this case, they would have handled it differently and understood the situation, uh, how it was not clear cut, and uh, and USADA wants to get it right. Um, uh, Gordon Mack. Hey, uh, Gordon Mack here from Flowtrack. I guess this is for anyone, coaches or Shelby. How has your the other athletes on BTC um, handled this news? I guess they got the news way back in January, but what has the past few months been like uh, for the teammates of BTC with uh, this news of Shelby dealing with this uh, doping situation? Shalane, you want that or you want me to do it? Sure. Um, yeah, Shelby, you can chime in too. Um, when Shelby found out, um, she notified Jerry right away, but she did happen to be with some teammates at the time of the notification. And as you can imagine, um, finding out, um, that kind of news, she obviously was upset and confided in them. So there were only a few women on the team that knew of Shelby's um, circumstances all these months. Um, we just wanted to protect her and just even the thought of, um, you know, someone potentially thinking um, that you're cheating. We just, we wanted to protect her and she's an innocent person. So we didn't want a reputation that wasn't genuine to be out there. So we did not share with our team um, fully until literally just the, when we found out the news on uh, Friday. So as you can imagine, um, we're a very close knit team. We're like family and um, it's been very, very difficult for everyone. Um, they care tremendously about Shelby. Um, she's like a sister um, and you know, they, what happens to one of them happens to all of them. So it's been obviously um, a really difficult last couple of days for everyone, but it's only because we care so much about Shelby. Yeah, I just want to speak on that a little bit. I, I definitely, I know it's been hard on everyone, especially since, you know, finding out in the last couple of days. Um, and I've been honestly floored by how supportive and just, how everyone wants to fight um, right alongside me. Uh, I feel extremely loved and cared for. And that's probably the only silver lining of all of this. Um, I think it it's definitely been the most, you know, um, stressful and broken time of my life and to have my teammates who I consider to be my family <laughs> right there alongside with me, standing with me and fighting with me and my coaches and my family. And, um, that's, that's meant everything to me. Um, so I, yeah, I just want to thank them for, for doing that. Um, Eric Bull. Thanks Emily. Uh, 
I, I guess this question would go, would go to Jerry. This is Jerry, when you mentioned, like, I mean, obviously this, like, it's, it's broken in the fact that it shouldn't have happened to Jerry and it shouldn't have happened to Ajay. It shouldn't have happened to Brenda, obviously. And it shouldn't happen to Shelby. Like, I mean, as Paul said, like usada has got a pretty good system going, but what role should USADA play in like informing WADA to be like, like people need to get their, you know, their house in order a, a little bit more because this is happening to way too many uh, athletes, you know, prominent athletes, clean athletes from our country. You know, Travis has been out there. Say. Travis has been out there. Sorry, Jerry. Is oh, okay Travis has been out there speaking on behalf of athletes in this situation, and I commend him for it. He's very public in his uh, support for, you know, this kind of situation that it shouldn't be happening. Uh, he even does this in foreign countries. I mean, Travis spoke about Shana Jack, who's a swimmer in Australia, who's about to get a four-year ban and in similar circumstances. And Travis went on the equivalent of 60 minutes in Australia to, to defend her. So there's a big, there's, there's not always, uh, the system does not always see to eye to eye on everything. And there's a lot of tension between WADA and USADA is, is you know, obvious with all the stuff related to the money in Congress. I mean, all the stuff is out in the open. And sometimes I think part of that happens American athletes sometimes get treated more harshly by the European federations. I'm not saying it's unique to just track in all sports. And I think, you know, I think it's unfortunate. Jerry, did you want to say something? No, Paul said it best. That's exactly right. Okay. Okay. Um, John Galt. Yeah, I was wondering if I could ask Paul what the exact um, concentration of nandrolone that was found in Shelby's urine was. Yep, it was for when you adjust her urine for specific gravity, which is the way you do it. Uh, she was very dehydrated and it was her first urination of the day. Uh, it was five nanograms per mil, which um, just to explain the way how low that is, um, normally, um, if it's above 15 nanograms, which is still really low, it's an automatic adverse analytical finding. Anything above 15 is an automatic adverse analytical finding. This GC IRMS testing only comes into play at these extremely low levels of 15 or below. So uh, her three markers in her urine, John, um, and no matter what the AIU says in response, they can never get around this. Her three markers were all consistent with borophil consumption. It says in the technical document, 10 or less, she was five. It says that her delta carbon value, and I can explain what that is without trying to go too sciencey on everyone in a second, but her delta carbon value, which is between minus 15 and minus 25, if you had this happen from a bore, was minus 23. And the ratio is five or below typically for pork. And her ratio, as I said, in her B was 3.9. I even put up that little chart that was done uh, as part of a WADA study that showed that and we, we had other studies showing that the synthetic ratios were seven and above uniformly. And her ratio again was less than four. All that's consistent with borophil. And I don't think, I think it was scientifically impossible to exclude it. And that in my view, that's why it had to be reported out as atypical because if it could be either that the lab documents mandate an atypical finding. Uh, Steve Soprano. Hi, Steve Soprano from Let's Run. Uh, just earlier, you mentioned a possible appeal to the Swiss federal court. Uh, I just wanted to ask if that's something you're definitely pursuing and uh, what the timeline and process looks like for that. So we have to think about that in terms of, we, we're gonna have to get a Swiss law firm on board with that. I, so only a Swiss lawyer can handle that and I'm definitely not a Swiss lawyer. So, um, you know, we're just still processing everything. Certainly that is her, her option is to do that. Um, but we have to wait probably until the reason decision comes out to reasonably have a chance um, to appeal because the Swiss court isn't gonna know the reasons why. Um, so, you know, that process could take a while. And, um, you know, you can, there's the opportunity to get an injunction from the Swiss federal tribunal. It happened in the Jose Paulo Guerrero case in 2016 before the World Cup. You can go back and look at that case. He was a Peruvian soccer player who got a ban from the cast and then the Swiss federal tribunal Got an give him an injunction. Um, so there are options Shelby can pursue here. Kara Goucher. Hi, I have one more question for Paul. Paul, we were at an anti-doping conference a couple of years ago and this topic came up. I remember. Yeah, and I don't know if you have the answer to this, but I mean, Jerry was able to spit off four names. What 
will it take and how would it take you WADA to update this policy? I mean, what would have to happen within WADA, you know, so that this policy of, of holding people accountable, I mean, like, I feel like USADA has changed. Do you have any indication or idea of what would have to happen to make WADA change the way they look at these findings at such small levels? Well, first, that's a great, I mean, just to say beyond those four, I've had just in my own practice, over 20 of these in the last two years with food contamination. And there's many, many others um, around the world. I, I wish we could all look to the UFC program. Um, Jeff Nowitzki, who was the, the doping cop um, for years with the US government, brought down Lance, everything else. Jeff went to the UFC, realized this was an issue. And they've implemented meaningful thresholds on these kinds of cases, and they operate that system with USADA, this would never have happened in a UFC case. What will it take? I don't know the answer to that, Kara, because there's so many players involved in the WADA world. And, you know, a lot of them are open and out there saying, look, this is the reverse of the system that we understand, that our criminal justice system is based on the Blackstonian ideal, which we all learn in law school, which is that I'd rather, you know, have, um, you know, a thousand guilty people go free than put one innocent man to death. That's the American sort of bedrock principle of criminal law. That is not the way it is with anti-doping. You're assumed guilty. Um, the strict liability standard is that way and the burden shifts to the athlete. And you know, the Jerry and Lawson case is reviled in the WADA world um, because uh, it, it, Jerry and had the audacity to actually be innocent and prove it. Um, they hate that case. You know, They talked about it in this case. So they don't want athletes to have rights. I, I mean, I don't understand why, because in my view, the system is weaker when innocent people get banned. It just doesn't make the system stronger, but that's the mindset. Uh, Allison Wade. Shelby, where do you go from here? Are you gonna keep training hard? Are you gonna take a break? Like, how do you, how are you looking forward and are you hoping for a Hail Mary or something like that? And also, will you be watching the trials? Yeah, I've kind of been trying to take it one day at a time, um, trying to be in the moment and find little positives throughout the day. Um, I don't really, know where I'm going to go from here. Um, <laughs> you know, I've been, my mind's been everywhere. Like, I want to keep training. I want to keep, I want to be able to come back at the same time. My heart's broken and I feel extremely betrayed by the sport and this whole process. I don't trust it anymore. Um, so as much as I want to come back, I also don't know if I could, um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know where I, where I go from here. Um, might just drive home back to Iowa and be with family. Um, I want to watch the trials. I would love to watch my teammates run um, and cheer for them. I think that'll be very difficult, um, but I want to support them the same way they're supporting me. Um, and I'm really, really sad that they have to you know, also go through this with me and in some, you know, this is one of some of the most important races of their lives. And I feel so bad that they have to deal with this. Um, it's not what I want for them either. Um, but again, I feel extremely fortunate that they don't seem to care and they're just here for me. Um, feel very grateful about that. But yeah, I mean, to answer your question, I, I don't have a solid answer. I'm just trying to take it one day at a time. All right, we're going to take a couple more. Couple more. Uh, Betsy Riley. Hi, Betsy Riley uh, from NBC. Just a question for you, Shelby. Could you take us back to December 15th? And for people who have never experienced it, just explain how um, the sample was taken or what you remember from that from that morning. Yes. Um, so I had my, my window set for 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. I had stayed the night um, at my then boyfriend's house um, and we were woken up at 6 a.m. Um, got, got tested, you know, it, to take you step by step through this. They 
ring the doorbell, you get notified, let them in and um, start filling out paperwork. And then you provide your urine sample with a, a doping control officer um, present. Um, they watch you give your sample. Um, then you pour it, you make sure everything's, you know, not opened or anything. Um, and then you pour your sample into an A bottle and a B bottle um, and seal it up, put it in a box um, and then typically seal that box. Um, and everything was normal that morning. I had no reason to think that this would be any different. Um, yeah, I, I, th I think we were joking around with, with the doping officers, like it was just another, another drug test. Um, I had no reason to believe that, like I said, that this would be any different. Um, and after that, I think, you know, I went back to bed and that was it. Johanna Gretschel. Hi, um, Shelby, was this your first positive test or had you ever failed a test before? No, this is my first positive test. I've never failed a test. I've never even missed a test. And let me just chime in one other thing. Um, the way that this substance, the oral nandrolone works, it's very, very fast in terms of the way it metabolizes from the body. So anyone that would have taken it would have known that and they could have easily moved their window. It, obviously this did not happen, but if Shelby had taken it, all she would have had to do is move her window from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. and she would have evaded being caught. That's how quick the stuff moves in and out of your body. In fact, the window in which it's under 15 nanograms, it came out in the hearing is probably less than 30 minutes. Um, when you take an oral nandrolone supplement, your level goes up to about 100,000 nanograms very quickly and then extremely, almost as quickly, it metabolizes out of the body and it's out of your body within 12 to 14 hours. In fact, nobody, has ever been caught taking an oral nandrolone supplement that they could, they could actually identify. 99 plus percent of people who get caught taking nandrolone are doing it by injection. And the reason is because you have to be an idiot to take oral nandrolone. It never doesn't actually help you at all. Nandrolone is a steroid that you take over weeks and months by injection to build up strength. You'd also have to be an idiot to take nandrolone as a distance runner because it would never help you. Um, it just makes no sense. All right, we're gonna take two more questions. Um, Kevin Sully. Yeah, on that same uh, topic, Paul, Jerry brought up um, Ajay Wilson and, and Jaren Lawson. What's the difference? I mean, is it just a matter of the substance being different in terms of the punishment here, do you think? No, I mean, the difference with Ajay's case is that USADA handled it um, and uh, Jerry's case was vigorously contested, just like this one. And in that case, uh, I mean, I was, I represented Jerry. And so I, you know, that was a vigorously contested case that we won. And this was a vigorously contested case that, that we didn't win. I mean, I can't tell you why that happened. Uh, cases are unpredictable in terms of the panels and in terms of the outcomes. Doug Binder. This would be for anybody, I guess. Um, is there a feeling that Shelby faced additional scrutiny by the doping agency, partly because of how how fast you ran last summer and breaking records? I don't think that that was part of it. I mean, this was a regularly scheduled out of competition test. In fact, she had been tested several times in November before that was negative, then was tested several times in January after it was positive. Uh, I can't remember the exact number, but it was like Shelby has been tested since 2016, probably over a hundred times. I would say the, the top athletes, top 10 in the world, um, get tested about every two weeks, whether it's USADA or WADA. So you basically know every two weeks you're going to be either providing a blood sample or a urine sample. Um, and in Shelby's case, she's a top 10 athlete, but any, any athlete that's top 10 in the world will be under those same type of protocols of every two weeks. Okay, uh, last question, Johanna, uh, Johanna Gretzel. Oh, sorry, that was a mistake. 
No worries. Um, I think that we're gonna we're gonna call it there. Um, thank you all for for coming. Um, I just want to say in closing that we ask that everyone please respect reaching out directly to the other Bowerman Track Club athletes ahead of the U.S. Olympic Trials. The athletes feel very passionately about their teammate and they support her in this process. They'll be releasing their own statements on social media. Um, if you have any questions, I ask that you please wait to speak with them in the media mix zone or you reach out to their athlete representative for comments. Um, that, that concludes our press conference. We, we thank you all for coming.